The Lord be with you. A starving artist was quoted as saying, the only problem with being poor is that it is a full-time job. That bit of grim humor highlights the unrelenting nature of poverty. Two of our lessons today are set in conditions of poverty involving two widows. Even in time periods separated by 900 years, widows were still the most marginalized people. God sent Elijah to challenge the prophets of Baal. Baal was the Canaanite god for rain, thunder, lightning, and dew. God commanded that no rain would fall, not even dew, until God again sent rain. And so for three years, no rain fell, and the land was desolate. During this time, God commanded Elijah to go to the area of Phoenicia, where there was a widow who would care for him. However, when he arrived, he found the widow in extreme poverty and was in the process of gathering sticks to prepare a last meal for her son and herself. But Elijah, knowing that she had only a small amount of food left, asked her to first make some bread for him. Hard to tell how I might respond to that. I don't have enough food for my son and I, and you want some of that. But Elijah assured her to not be afraid to first make bread for him and then for themselves. They were sustained for many days. The jar of flour and the jug of oil never ran out. Fast forward 900 years. Jesus had been teaching in the temple, warning his disciples to beware of the scribes who act so religiously but take advantage of widows. While observing the people, almost as if on cue, he saw a widow putting her last fractions of a cent into the temple treasury, all that she had. She, in her poverty, had given everything. Others were giving large sums of money, but that was money they would never miss. This account is known as the story of the widow's might, a might being a small value coin of that time. In researching this account, I found paintings portraying the widow placing her last coins into the temple treasury. Some artists portrayed the widow as old and some as young with children. But one thing kept hitting me. Their faces bore an expression of quiet desperation. Since the artists are likely poor as well, Perhaps this was just transference of their own feelings to the canvas. But why wouldn't you feel, have a feeling of desperation? There is nothing even remotely humorous about poverty. Food, shelter, comfort, safety were all uncertainties in their future. I have never been that poor. Even in my most meager state, I still had a roof over my head and food to eat. Most of us here today are probably not in extreme poverty, but one does not have to be poor to lead a life of quiet desperation. Consider the opposite end of the extreme. Perhaps you have climbed the ladder of success only to find out it's against the wrong wall, as the saying goes. Now what? What do I do with my life? Maybe you have worked hard and you are comfortable and secure but still dissatisfied. Life holds no challenges, and you feel like you're just marking time until your last day. Over 150 years ago, Thoreau wrote in his book Walden that the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. Even then, he felt that misplaced value was the cause. We feel a void in our lives, and we attempt to fill it with things like money, possessions, and accolades. We think these things will make us happy. When they don't, we just seek more of them. Thoreau's solution? Shed those false values and lead the simple life. There are other forms of poverty. For some, their negative self-talk has convinced them that they're too old 
or not talented or a failure or too afraid to step out or, 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 or the list is long. They are frozen in time, but time marches on and the feeling just grows. Maybe life's events, a loss of health or a loved one, have left you with uncertainty and you find it difficult to move forward. Some experience a poverty of relationship. Today we are richer, more informed, and connected electronically than ever before, but also unhappier, more isolated, and less fulfilled. What counts today as connectedness has displaced the real thing, connection, community. A recent Washington Post article stated that an epidemic of loneliness grips our land. They cited research demonstrating that persistent loneliness reduces longevity more than some physical conditions. To quote, we are literally dying of despair of the failure to fill the whole millions of Americans feel in their lives. But the feeling of desperation can come regardless of doing all the right things. What turns that feeling of desperation into a life of desperation is resignation, the loss of hope. As disciples of Christ, the hope of all the world, are we to live in resignation to quiet desperation or in noisy, exuberant hope? To live in hope is to trust in, wait for, look for, desire something or someone, or to expect something beneficial in the future. Some word scholars have proposed that the origin of the word hope has a connection with the word hop, suggesting leaping in expectation. To live in hope, we must trust in the source, which gives us confidence in the future. Elijah's widow appears to have lost hope and resigned her son and herself to death by starvation. But she trusted the word of God from Elijah and noticed made Elijah's bread anyway. A sliver of hope remained. They were sustained. The widow in the gospel lesson, even though she may have been manipulated by the scribes to contribute her last cent to the temple, still did it out of her trust in God for provision. In complete trust, she gave all that she had. Throughout history, people have had their hope tested. There's a quote attributed to Martin Luther. Even if I knew that tomorrow the world would go to pieces, I would still plant my apple tree. People have puzzled over the meaning of this statement. But scholars could find this quote nowhere in Luther's writings. In fact, they found that the first occurrence of this quote was 1944, World War II. They attributed the saying to the German confessing church, the underground church, which was used to inspire hope during the opposition to Nazi dictatorship. The meaning? We will eat the fruit from that tree someday. Keep on. I am sure you here today have had your hope tested as well. One such time in my own life occurred in 1988, 1998. Our tiny premature daughter, Hannah, was facing another struggle in the neonatal ICU. And I had left work to be with her. I was standing at the scrub sink, disinfecting my arms and hands, as I had done so many times. My own face must have revealed my anguish and desperation because I felt a touch on my arm. I turned to see an elderly nun who looked at me with those peaceful, loving eyes and said one thing, don't lose hope. I never saw her again, and I'm not saying I was visited by an angel or anything, but like a swimmer who reaches the surface of the water gasping for breath, those words breathe new life and hope into me. Oh, I've had many times and many occasions from my hope to be beaten up and kicked to the curb, but I always remember, don't lose hope. So what gives us hope? 
Is it perseverance, resilience, determination, or just being plain stubborn? Those are important characteristics, character traits, to be sure, but they are like gas in a tank, depleted over time without a refill from the source. No, what gives us hope is the unshakable promise that God loves us, not just us in this room, but beyond these walls, this city or this country, without requirements or conditions. You do realize that out there is not them, it is us. The solidarity that we have with all of humankind is that we all suffer. We have so much in common. I sometimes think the most awesome act of God <clears throat> is to love us because we are all at times so unlovable. So why does, how can God love us? God loves us not because we are good. Praise God for that. What a relief, right? There's no worthiness contest or meritocracy involved. God loves us because God is good. God is always and forever the initiator of this love. And we are the respondents. And our response matters because God makes use of everything we offer. That is what is called a relationship. I don't know about you, but it seems like we as a community have been through it for the last year or so, and we still have a ways to go. They say the road less traveled makes all the difference. It is less traveled because it is unpaved, filled with rocks, and uphill both ways. But this road we have taken, and I have every confidence that God is leading the way. Our community in Christ is vitally important, not just to us, but to the poor in possessions, the poor in relationships, and the poor in existence around us. Let's live in noisy, exuberant hope, leaping in expectation. God is good all the time. On that we can depend. Amen.